It is good to be here this morning, amen? amen? To enjoy one another's company and build those bonds that we have in Christ. We want to make sure that we pray for all those that are headed to camp this afternoon and uh, make sure they have a wonderful week to be edified and built up. Caleb is already there, so uh, we want to pray that there is uh, good success in that endeavor. You may have seen this traveling down the highway on the back of someone's car, and as you read it, you probably thought to yourself, huh. But there are many logos on it that espouse a differing ideology, and as you contemplate each one of them, you realize that each one of those are mutually exclusive ideas. And you begin to wax philosophical, maybe, and think to yourself, I wonder what I don't know about those that this sign seems to be telling me. And those letters of that symbol, or at least all of those symbols put together, would make out the word coexist. You might have seen this emblazoned on t-shirts of college students. You might have seen it on posters in restaurants that you've gone to or uh, frequented. Uh, but it is a prominent bumper sticker that is affixed to many young people's vehicles. And I think one of the reasons is because they have a false or misunderstood view of each one of those ideologies that make up that term coexist. This, I think, results in the spiritual milieu that we find ourselves in today. Our society would value all forms of religious expression. And while there is no doubt that we can't get out of what we see around us, not only in the religious world writ large, but also in Christendom, if we even narrow our scope, what we come to realize is that there is the presence of absolutes. Jesus the Christ was narrow-minded when it came to the truths that were found as he expressed them, the absolutes of his person, of who he was, what he claimed, and about truth. And as that narrow-mindedness goes, many people would accuse us of being narrow-minded as well, that is, rigid in our adherence to those things that we know to be true. And people view this as a, not a compliment, but as an insult. Uh, you may have been called narrow-minded in your life before and thought to yourself, hey, I'm open to certain things. But the greatest scholar that the world has ever known, Jesus the Christ, was narrow-minded. And I want to talk about him this morning and the things that he was narrow-minded about. That is, had a rigid thinking of and was fixed in his views toward. Jesus the Christ was narrow-minded about the truth. When you and I look around today, there are many people who would espouse that there is no absolute truth, only subjective moral relevance. And those who would espouse absolute truth don't know what they're talking about. Objectivity cannot be had in the realm of religious discourse, some might say. And yet those same people would go on to espouse objectivity in the physical world, in the natural law. Gravity always pulls down or towards itself or towards the center or that larger mass. They would argue that atoms always react in a certain way when this particular group of electrons are put together. Uh, they would argue for chemistry and say, look, we see these laws that are affixed to the natural elements around us. By that, we know that objectivity has to exist. I'm reminded of an instance when there was a lecturer that got up in front of a large audience, an auditorium. And he got up and the first declaration that he made was, there is no absolute truth. And just immediately a hand shot up in the audience raised it very high, and the man called on this individual, and he said, yes, sir, can I help you? And the man rose and said, are you sure? <laughs> Everything he said from there on was, or fell on deaf ears. Why? Because if one makes a truth claim that there are absolutes, or that there are no absolutes, rather, that is a truth claim, which is absolute. Logic prohibits us from appealing to subjective moral relevance. But Jesus was absolute in his understanding of the truth and that it can indeed exist. While I was a student at the University of Texas, uh, I saw emblazoned on the front of the main building of the UT Tower there, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And yet... In the place or the program that I was involved in, which 
basically held the philosophy section, that was argued day in and day out, and none of them ever really knew that that came from John 8 and verse 32, where Jesus the Christ says that very thing. In fact, I argued with one of my friends one day, and as we were approaching this building, I pointed up there, and I said, do you know who said that? And he said, Plato. And I said, not even close. Jesus the Christ was narrow-minded in his view toward the truth. In John 8, 32, he tells his disciples, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But how many today believe that truth is subjective and relative? If it is, then it's not really truth. You might have heard people say, well, your truth is your truth. Or, or that's just true for you. Well, look, something can't be true for someone else objectively and not true for someone else objectively. It is either true or not true, regardless of how it is applied. Universalism would be the mantra of our time, inclusion for all. Everyone ought to be included. And while we cannot go out and cull the world of all the false views that are out there, what we can do, and we can go a great deal further in teaching the truth as it is in Christ, hoping that other people will respond to that gospel and come to a knowledge of Christ. It's fascinating to me to see people espouse this subjective idea or view with regard to truth claims that are in the religious sphere, but claim an adherence to the truth in the physical world whether those claims are valid or substantiated or even provable. You see, if there is no absolute truth, here's the real crux of the matter, then God is a liar, and we can do whatever we want. If there is an objective truth, then we need to know what it is so that we have a shot at doing it. Jesus would tell his disciples in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. What is truth? He says, thy word is truth. So if we want to know where truth, spiritual truth lies, we know that it is found in the Word of God. Jesus makes that claim assuredly. So if we have these ideas religiously, we need to go to confirm them in the Word of God so that we can be sure that what we are doing or practicing or even teaching is in accord with what God intends for us. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus is incredibly exclusionary in the way he says people can be saved. In that respect, he says that no one can get to the Father except they go through Jesus the Christ. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, Paul would tell Timothy there to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of Truth. So the word of truth, that is the word of God, is also the word of truth. We see these dovetail nicely on one another as the biblical writers refer to the word of God. Jesus was very narrow-minded, rigid in his thinking about the truth, and that it was attainable, and that we can know it, and that we can live in the way that God intends us to live. James 1 and verse 18, James would tell us, Of his own will begat he us, that we might be a kind of, by the word of truth, I'm sorry, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. How are we begotten of God? We respond to the gospel as it is in Christ, as it is in truth, and come into union with that blood being and having our sins remissed. But Jesus was incredibly narrow minded about truth. He was not a relativist. He didn't say that, well, you just believe what you want to believe. He gave absolutes. He gave standards for man's conduct, and he has the expectation that each man adhere to those standards as well. But secondly, Jesus the Christ was narrow-minded about himself. As I mentioned before in John 14, 6, right, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He was also very narrow-minded or rigid in his thinking about his role as the Messiah, what he had come to do. The Pharisees withstood him multiple times when he made these claims about himself. In fact, they were angry when he made himself divinity, at least as they perceived it. It enraged them. But Jesus never relented about who he was. I've heard modern commentators today say that really Jesus' views of himself were not in any way 
that he was the Messiah or that he was divinity. Rather, later individuals went back and imposed those views on Jesus to inflate the narrative to make it seem larger than it really was supposed to be. Now, there's a problem with that idea because that does not go at all with what the Old Testament tells us about the Christ. Paul would tell us, or Jesus would tell the Pharisees, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus making the remark in that instance that the Old Testament scriptures are the ones that predict the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and who he was and what he was supposed to do. And when you and I look back at the Old Testament, we can see evidence for us very clearly that those scriptures taught of a Messiah who would come and redeem mankind from sin, not redeem physical Israel from a Roman oppression or yoke. And so often modern commentators will argue that Jesus did not think this about himself, but I would argue the opposite. Jesus makes claims about himself being divinity uh, multiple times. He was the Messiah that was to come. In John 4 and verse 25, as Jesus is discussing uh, the, with the woman of the well at Samaria, religious themes, uh, he makes the statement, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah has come, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak with thee am he. In that very statement, Jesus makes the claim that he was the Messiah that was prophesied about in the Old Testament. Paul would tell us in Romans 15, 4, that the things which were written aforetime were written for our learning. Part of that learning is coming to a knowledge of who Jesus was and is, and what his role in redemption is as well. We'll see the Hebrews writer flesh that out uh, in much or far greater detail as we open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. But the Old Testament testifies of Jesus. And Jesus the Christ, here in this discussion with the woman at the well, says, I that speak with thee am he. Claiming this Messiahship. He was also the Son of God. In John 5 and verse 17, the Bible there says, Jesus answered them, My father works hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, which that's a no-no, but said also that God was his father, and here's their anger, making himself equal with God. Jesus had no problem claiming divinity. This did not bother him at all. And the fact that he claimed divinity and accepted worship when individuals fell at his feet tells us that Jesus was divinity in itself. He came, Emmanuel, God with us. That is divinity, and that's found in the book of Isaiah. If we go back to the old prophets, what we'll see is this discussion all the time about God being with us, and Jesus claimed divinity. But here's the thing. If Jesus is claiming divinity, and Jesus claims that no man goes to the Father but through him, then that means that Christianity is the only way exclusively that man can be found right with God today. That is a hard pill for people to swallow. But it's not necessarily that that is a hard thing to understand. It's the implications of such a statement. The implications of a statement like that say that anyone outside of the scope of God's grace in Christ is eternally lost. And that's the hard thing for people to swallow. Because that statement has a far greater implication. Is God really going to allow that many folks to be lost? I want to express this, or at least tell you this. People don't go to hell because they're not baptized. People do not go to hell because they're not baptized. People are not saved because of sin. You see... Individuals that don't respond to the gospel do not absolve themselves of sin in the blood of Christ and therefore as a result are lost. And oftentimes I think we misunderstand or misconstrue the gospel and what its intent is. Jesus would make the declaration in Matthew 28 that we need to go into just a little bit of the world, right? Just a little bit of the world and teach some of the gospel to a few folks. I'm being facetious here. No, no. Go into all the world, right? 
Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We have an obligation to meet everyone with the gospel, with the hope to bring them out of the devil's grasp. But Jesus in his person would make the claim that he was divinity. You see, this was the highest blasphemy, though, for a Jew. For one to claim divinity went far beyond what the Jewish expectation was of the Messiah. They did not think that highly of him. This would not be something they could tolerate at all because the idea itself was foreign to their thinking. Having God be present with them in human form, this was not something that they had been brought up on or at least were expecting. It was possible in their mindset to have prophets who are endowed with miraculous gifts to go and work those miracles. And we see this expectation fulfilled in the Old Testament with Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, or not Jeremiah, but uh, other of the prophets. And yet here, Jesus the Christ is doing these miracles, but now not only does he do the miracles, he claims divinity. This is taking it a step further than what he had ever done before. And so he was narrow-minded in his view toward himself, but so were the early apostles. In fact, when John is writing through the Holy Spirit by inspiration in John chapter 1, he makes the statement, For the law was given by Moses... But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He would go on to say, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten of the Father, which is in his bosom, he hath declared him. So in this statement, Jesus the Christ is making a claim that he was with God. In fact, if we look at verse 1 of John 1, the Bible would there tell us, In the beginning was the Word, that is Jesus. And the Word was with God, present with him eternally, and the Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that is made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In this claim, what we're saying is that Jesus is far and above greater than any other religious tenet or view, and that Jesus Christ as divinity has the sole claim for absolute truths in this life. And again, John 14, 6, no man would come to the Father except through Jesus the Christ. He was the one who declared God and His presence as well. If we go back and look at the Old Testament and the statements that are made concerning Jesus the Christ, Jesus answers the Pharisees when they are talking with Him that He is, I am. A direct reference to the Old Testament and the God of heaven there. Again, inflaming their sensibilities about who He was. If Jesus was the only one who declared the Father, then that means that he was with the Father and could claim divinity. And the claims that he made were 100% true. Philippians 2 and verse 5, we might go a little bit further and peel back the layers in Jesus the Christ. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was found in fashion as a man." What Paul is telling us there is that there is some aspect or element of divinity that the Christ divested himself of when he took upon this form and was found in fashion as a man. He did not think that equality with God, even as some men today would say that Jesus is not equal with God, he didn't think that it was something that was, should be held on to because he was. He was equal with God. And yet, he let part of that go so that he could come here to save you and me. Jesus was incredibly narrow-minded in his view about who he was, the work that he was to accomplish as the Messiah here. He was the bread of life, John 6 and verse 35. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I believe Jesus was also incredibly narrow-minded about salvation. I know there is a common plea in the denominational world today about many ways that one might be saved. I think Jesus' words are appropriate, though, when he gives his disciples the Great Commission. Jesus responded to the baptism of John. As John went out in the, the wilderness to baptize, Jesus went out in response to this call. And as John and Jesus are standing there... John makes the declaration that I'm not worthy to unloose your sandals at all. 
And Jesus makes the response, Thus it behoveth us to fulfill all righteousness. You see, John didn't want to baptize Christ, but Jesus thought it was right and appropriate to fulfill all righteousness, all those things that God intended for man to do. Did that mean that Jesus the Christ had sin? No, we know that he did not have sin. The Hebrews writer would tell us as much. So what Jesus does is show us that a response, number one, to the gospel is important, or to the, the call of God is important. But secondly, in his declaration, when he says, I have all authority in heaven and earth, it's given to me. And then the very next thing he tells them to do is go and baptize. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, with his first command, having full authority, having been resurrected, tells his disciples, go teach them the truth as it is in the gospel and baptize them. He ties those two together, cannot be excerpted from the plan of salvation. Paul would say as much in Romans chapter 6. So we continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid, how can we who died to sin live any longer therein? Or do you not know that as many of you who are baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? So we see this example given for us by Paul, this picture of putting oneself to death and being raised to walk in that new life. It is part and parcel to the gospel plan of salvation. And yet I hear so many people say, well, all they have to do is, well, just say this little prayer. Or make this little faith statement. Or where is your witness or your testimony that, that you are saved, some might say. Or did God appear to you in such a way that would indicate that you're one of the elect? You see, all of these things are outside the plan of salvation. All of them go beyond what is written in God's word. And none of them suffice when it comes to our relationship with God if we don't fulfill what God intends for us in that respect. I hear so many people try and circumvent the plan of salvation, and yet, well, I'll stop there. But he was the only one to bring salvation. John 3 and verse 16, in his discussion with Nicodemus, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, note the important word here, should not perish, but have everlasting life. What he says there with that word, should not perish, means that it is possible for people to lose their salvation. It's something that we need to be concerned about and need to work on day in and day out as we live here below. We need to be thinking about our eternal home with God, how to please Him. John 14, 15, if you love me, Jesus would say, keep my commandments. Christian, Christianity has the sole claim to salvation apart from all religions, and there is no salvation in any other. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, uh, Peter would say, For there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. That is a generalizing statement. That is a universal truth. And Jesus was very narrow minded in the assumption that no one can be saved apart from him. Again, John 14, 6 I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So we can't expect salvation apart from the gospel that is given by the Christ himself. Acts 19.1, I find it interesting that even as the dialogue of John's baptism closes, we come into the discussion of Christ's baptism, that part of the New Testament is finished now. We have the Apostle Paul arriving in the upper coast at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 and runs into certain disciples there. And those individuals have been baptized with the baptism of John. And as Paul approaches them, he says, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, We've not so much as heard as whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he asked them the question, Under what were you baptized? And, he said, and they said, John's baptism. And then we see what Paul's statement to them was, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying that they should believe on him who should come after. And then what did Paul do? He took them aside and he baptized them, and then laid hands upon them, giving them the measure of the Spirit in that particular place. What that tells us is that it is important for us to be baptized into the right thing. Even though these men had responded to the baptism of John and that teaching... There was something that was lacking in there. Most likely they had been baptized in the baptism of John after Christ had died and instituted the baptism into Christ. 
So there had to of necessity be a change there. And so Paul, in instructing them about who the Christ was, teaches them and then they are re-immersed. And I appreciate the sincerity of heart in those men who didn't just say, well, you know, what we did was good enough. We don't see that. We see the disposition of those who want to serve God, that they have tender hearts and they respond in kind. But Jesus is very narrow-minded about our salvation. He would say, this is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, as Peter is talking to the Pharisees here. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. Also, the Hebrews writer says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify them with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no consuming city, but we seek one which is to come. The Hebrews writer also explaining to us that Christ is the way that we are saved. Matthew 11 and verse 28, Jesus would make the declaration, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But then lastly, Jesus was very narrow-minded about discipleship. Jesus was narrow-minded about those that would follow him. Luke tells us that no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God in Luke 9.23. In Luke 9.62, in Luke 9 verse 23, he says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Oftentimes I look at other adherents to other religions and it's just this this sinecura, this, this without care type of office, we can affiliate ourselves or associate ourselves with it, but there's really no obligations involved. When it comes to Christianity, that could not be further from the truth. If we want to be true disciples, as God intends us to be, that means that we're going to have to daily focus on our relationship and walk with God. That's got to be first and foremost in our lives. Are we what God wants us to be, and are we growing and developing into what God wants us to be? Jesus clearly says that no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That is, is suited for the kingdom of God. Why? Because he's got his affection set on the things of the past, not on the things ahead. If I've, I've mentioned this before, but... Uh, if you're plowing a row with a mule, one of the things that you have to do is look right between his ears and pick a tree at the end of the field line or the fence line and plow just straight to that tree and don't look anywhere else. And the reason is, if you start looking back or looking around, you lose spot of that tree and you lose your guide and then you've got a field full of crooked rows. Jesus is making an analogy here. If you keep looking back, your rows are going to be crooked, your life's going to be crooked, things are going to be off. Look forward to God. Look forward to God. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross every once in a while, daily, and follow me. Jesus says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus is very narrow-minded about discipleship and about what it will take for us to follow him. Being able to make those sacrifices in life to put God first in everything it is that we do, everything that we are as we strive to live here below. I'm grateful that Jesus the Christ was narrow-minded because that gives us some solidarity, some sure footing, something that we can stand on, something that we can know and be confident in. But Jesus the Christ was also very broad-minded as well. You see, Jesus accepted every class of sinner if they would but repent. Jesus allowed them to come to him Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus was broad-minded in all cultures that could come to him. It wasn't just for Israel. 
Although he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that saving message was for the world. And you and I, through it, can have eternal life. And because of that, how many lives have been changed for the better? Because of a broad-minded Messiah who is willing to open his arms to the world at large who had been lost in sin and receive them back to him through the ultimate sacrifice given through his blood. You see, while Jesus is rigid in his thinking about these absolutes that we discussed this morning, Jesus is also very fair and broad-minded, open-minded to allow all men to come unto him if they but choose to submit to his will, to his authority in their lives, and live as God would see fit. If you realize this morning that you've not been confident in your walk with God, you've not stood on those truths, you've maybe endorsed some of those other views or thought they really were just okay, and I want to encourage you to rethink your position on those things. Begin to dive into God's Word and see what He tells us about those views that are errant or false. And if you realize that you stand outside of Christ this morning, you've not had your sins remissed, being washed in the waters of baptism... I want to encourage you this morning to respond to the gospel without delay. If you have any need, won't you come as we stand and sing our song of encouragement.